That's okay. Not not a problem. You're, you're rolling now, right? Rolling. And you're rolling over there? Okay, <clears throat> good. Okay. This Harold Cox, born in Hoopston, in Rossville, moved, eventually wound up in Hoopston. And I want to actually start a little, you know, as 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 the war is beginning, I guess. Yeah. We'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be concentrating a little bit on, on the war because when you... When the war started, you were already working for a while up I, in Chicago. I worked in Hoopston first, and I went to Chicago. Okay. And I worked up there about four years. But while I was up, I was up there about a year, and they made me foreman in the machine shop. And I got married June the 29th, 41. And my brother was already in the service. And then I was one ace along, and I had to do things I didn't like to do to some of the employees. If they couldn't do the work, it was my job to kind of give them a boot. And we had crane operators. I had a supervisor over two 50-ton crane op cranes and one 15-ton crane. And we moved all this stuff, and we made stuff for different places. So like you mentioned, this is military equipment that you guys are making. Yeah, we've made, at this Clearing Machine Corporation, they made presses. They used the automobile industry, and they made presses that would stamp out 50 caliber machine gun bullets, and they made presses that would power out a 105 Hauser. It had three prongs on it, it was a horizontal run. They said it and made it in the shop, the only one they ever made. And it used to take eight hours for a layman to turn out a 105 nose. And when they got through with this, they could turn out one every hour. That's kind of, and then they made some big, big steam hydraulics. They had big cylinders. They shipped them to Europe over in uh, Russia. Thirteen of them got there. One got lost in the sea. And uh, that was the kind of stuff we were doing in this machine shop. Mm -hmm. It was a pretty good sized machine shop. We had Ingersoll Mills. It was damn 14 to 16 feet high. We had Ingersoll Flat Mills and Mill Castings. We weighed 70 ton. It had four cutter heads on them. Run them water on them, soluble water, to keep them cool. And they kept two guys on this one machine 24 hours a day to keep the chips hauled away with two wheelbarrows. <laughs> That's how fast that thing cut. So you, you, were a foreman there of the factory. Did that keep you out of the military? Is that to... that deferred me out of the military, and mm -hmm. they wanted me to stay. And I said, "Well, I think I'd better go." So I went home, took a thirty-day vacation, got my wife set up in a new place, and I had to move her twice in that thirty days before we got one suitor. And then I went back to the, I went to the service. And uh, that was the spring of the 44. Why'd you decide to finally go? Well, number one, there are probably two reasons. My brother was already in the service. And the other reason is I, I was getting a lot of pressure on being foreman in the machine shop, which was okay, but I only got off every other Sunday for a whole year, for four years. I made a lot of money. I saved a lot of money. When I come home from the service, the people said, where'd you, where, how did you get your money? I said, I already had it. My wife, I think, got $70 a month I sent home to her. That's all she got. So you, you, you enlisted because being a foreman was getting <laughs> a little, a little rough, I guess. Or well, just... it's, you had to, you tell somebody to do something, 
And then he goes over there and he pushes a big flywheel over, breaks two or three legs. And I've just got through talking to him. He do it 30 minutes later and broke both legs. Some other guys on the cutter, I told him to stay away from in front of them cutters. And one of them fell on the big piece he was cutting and got all cut up on his face before he got away from it. Just little things like that. So it's, yeah. I, I had fun though. They asked me one time, the superintendent and the foreman, Floyd McDaniels, they wanted us to turn a casting with two 50 ton cranes. Sent everybody out of the shop. The only ones there that evening was McDaniels, myself, three crane operators, and two riggers. We turned a 107 ton casting with two 50 ton cranes. And I'll tell you, we never lifted the thing one inch off of the big timbers, 12 by 12 timbers. Never lifted that thing over an inch. Because if it, if a chain had broke or something had broke, who knows what had happened. Yeah. So you, you, you leave the shop. Yeah. <laughs> And and you enlist, yeah. so tell tell me tell me what the what the process was there. You stayed in Chicago, I guess, right? Is that I stayed you... in Chicago, mm -hmm. and I was in one A all the time. I was up there, and every six months I get a one A, and they deferred it for me, kept deferring it, and finally in the spring of forty four, I said I think I'll go home and take a 30-day leave and join. So I took a 30-day leave, went home, and my son was born while I was up there, as Howard Cox, and he was born at Berwyn Hospital. So we come home and got a place here to live. And then I was shipped to Camp Fannin, Texas, a little town by Tidar, Texas. Mm. And we trained there as a, I trained as a pioneer with a battalion of cooks, chauffeurs, and clerks. So it's a pioneer, what, what uh, group? To do it? road work for the, the, the Army and cut down, trim trees, or whatever it had to do to get somebody through a hole. So was, that went on off when it was hot down there. Man, it was hot. So we got a notice that all of us were going to go down the hill. Down the hill, that was straight infantry. So we went down the hill, and they run us so many miles a day, and got up at five o'clock or for breakfast, and maybe went a couple miles before we eat breakfast. And those cooks down there was about the lousiest cooks I ever run into. But the ones up in our battalion before we went down there were the best, because there's a cook battalion up there. But the cooks down there, one morning we went down there to eat, and they would give us a sound like rotten eggs. And boy, they had a, that turned out to be a brawl. <laughs> but they got that cleaned up real quick. So they sent us out on the range. We'd done a lot of rifle practice and mortar practice. And of course, in the, when I was up on the hill with Pioneer Battalion, we had every kind of piece of equipment from a handgun to a 50 caliber machine gun in the Pioneer Battalion. We had all that stuff. We was pretty well drilled on it. So we was a lot better than some of them guys were down below. So I was out on the range one day down there shooting and the lieutenant standing behind me and he kicked me in the seat of the pants. He said, you know you missed that whole target? It's 300 yards, you couldn't see where you hit. I'd shot rapid fire. I was used to when I was a kid. I used to do a lot of hunting. Mm -hmm. I come up and got a bunch of high. I got a high score. I got a like ten points, having a perfect score. 
lieutenant looked at me and never said a thing and walked away. That's the end of that. They even gave me a carton of cigarettes for doing that. And I didn't, I didn't even smoke. I gave them away. So you trained in the infantry. Where Did you do any other training elsewhere in the country before you no. went over? No. There's just two spots right there. When we got through down there below the hill, my wife came down to visit me. And, of course, I was trained down below the hill. I happened to hit it wrong. I didn't know this was going to happen. And we, man, they loaded us up and shipped us out real quick, the whole bunch. And they shipped us on Queen Mary to England. And that Queen Mary was loaded. And on the, all on the trip, old Mickey Rooney was going across at the same time. And he was up in the bow of the ship. Old Mickey was playing crafts with everybody who could, and everybody could get to him because it was all lined up waiting turns. That was kind of a sight. The fourth day out, I was leaning over the side of the ship, and a bunch of guys got sick and made me sick. So we got into England. We landed Queen Mary in there. They loaded us, took us out on a range for one day, one day on the range. And the clerk didn't know much about guns. The chauffeurs didn't know much about guns. And all these guys, they only got two weeks training on it. And then they shipped, and then they put us on those 48 cars or whatever they call them. These are the box cars. Uh, no, for the, the train, box train cars. Uh, in England, we got on train. Mm -hmm. Worked third south into England, and uh, they took us across the channel. We got across the channel, and they'd already had big fight there before, you know, VD. And then they took us up there. And put us in the camp, all set up for us. <laughs> you get this one, you get this, and just so by the numbers. And the first thing I knew, Lauren Colson and me got one with about four inches of water in it. Got one? Ten, ten with four inches of water in it. So we had to lay our two duffel bags side by side and lay across them that night. And that was the worst night I had. And this was this was the summer of forty four? Yeah. Fall of forty four? Okay. Yeah. So the next day they come in with their six by sixes, these big army trucks, loaded us on them, and took us to Paris, France. So what was that like for someone from Hopeston, Illinois to wind up in Paris, France after a few months of training? Wasn't there very long. <laughs> there was so many of us in each one of those trucks it had, only had standing room. I won't tell you everything that happened. But anyhow, we got down there. And then they let us stay there one night. And then they loaded us up and took us one way out of France going north. And we went up there and we went by and you, so you see some soldiers stacked along the road, about three deep. Then we went up a little further. We didn't encounter too much. We lost a couple of lieutenants and a couple of BAR men. Come back, and when they come back, there were stakes out there. They come up and picked us up, brought us back, and they had stakes out there with these guys and dog tags and names on them. Then we stayed around Paris one more day to rest up a little bit. Then they shipped us out again and went the other direction. We spent seven days on that venture. So the next day, when we went out the next time, we headed out. I think there was one plane flew over scraping, a private plane. It wasn't a regular army plane. All the guys dived off under the pine trees. 
And on that trip up, we didn't have much contact with anybody. So I was on, on that trip for seven days, and what we was doing was evidently checking out to where everybody was at in the enemy. And so that even one evening, the day I got hit by a mortar about dust, I got hit December the 1st, 44, and I thought I was in France, and I was in Germany. So, so to back up a little bit, you were, when you left Paris, there was still, you know, there was still shooting in that area. In, in that area, I guess it hadn't been completely. Well, Paris parked up close, but you get out. It wasn't nothing close. Mm -hmm. You got out. Now, one, I was. Well, before I got wounded, I want to tell you this was something that I did one night. Mm -hmm. Maybe a night before, or two before I got killed. They sent me out, and they got these little dams across the river, Sar River, Sar Lot, or whatever it is. And I stood guard there that night, and you couldn't even see in front of your hand. It was so dark, but you could hear a pin drop. So I got off of that deal in the morning. And they had TD-90s, anti-aircraft guns, behind us. They were firing in the hills across the river. They'd shoot up, three up, three down, over and up and down. They'd done that on that hill, and you see people running and diving or hiding. But that's the end of that. But then when I went on up there and got hit with a mortar, there was no firing or no nothing. That mortar come in and hit between me and the building. So that day, we can we sort of set up. You, you, you're saying that there wasn't, there was no activity that day. No, it just happened. So how how did you know what what time of day was it? When, when did but, when? a little bit before dust, mm -hmm. a mortar come in and hit between me and the building. And it blew me up in the air. And I come down. And, I, and they taught us down at Camp Fan in Texas to, how to do certain things. And so I jerked my belt off, put it around my leg, give it a jerk, and that's the last thing I remember. I woke up in Paris, France. Do you know, remember how much... How, how long it was before between there? How many days? You know, when, what day you remember? You mean, it was seven Regaining days. Regaining consciousness? I was unconscious. I don't remember nothing after it. I woke up in the hospital in Paris, France. When I got hit, I didn't remember nothing. They fed me through things for 30 days. I couldn't eat nothing. You could run a needle and hit my leg up here, clear down to my ankle. Cleared the bone, wouldn't even feel it. So I stayed there for a few days. And then the first night, they gave me a blood transfusion. German prisoner. And I had gangrene in my hip. Next night, another German prisoner, another blood transfusion. And I just barely, would, I don't remember the first one, but I remember the second one. And then they keep giving me medication, feed me through the veins. I, I, I couldn't eat nothing. Every time I eat something, I threw it up. So that went on for about 30 days. And then they finally took us to England, put us in a hospital up there, going to fly us home. We sat up there. They kept taking care of us. I lost a lot of weight. I lost over 70 to 80 pounds. So finally, they decided to send us home on a ship. And it was a Liberty ship. Instead of like Queen Mary you went over in five days, the Liberty ship was 12 days. Smaller boat. Smaller boat. Mm -hmm. 
liberty, it was a liberty ship of some kind. And then a machine shop in Chicago, I helped make transmissions for those things. And I'd hear, hear that rough water, and you hear that boat go up like this and come out of the water. You hear that thrust bearing hit. I said, boy, there's one I remodeled. I hope that ain't the one I fixed up in Chicago. <laughs> I had to plug it and replug it and do it. Re do it. And this guy goofed it up, and I got the job of finishing the next set. That day, I worked 16 hours in Chicago. <laughs> so you're hoping it wasn't the same ship. <laughs> I was hoping it wasn't. So when you were, uh, how much do you remember, you know, when you when you were in the hospital and you were losing you were losing weight, I lost the weight all in about sixty days. Mm -hmm. But you still had your leg at that point, right? No, they, they took they it, it off, off the first night. Oh, okay. They took it off first night to knee, and the second night they took it off up here. Mm -hmm. I got about that much bone left. I ain't got much left. Mm -hmm. And were they? I mean, where they were? You mentioned you had gangrene on the hip as well, so yeah. you had to deal with that as See, well. See, I was in the street next to a building. They got livestock running around. So that's the reason probably I got that. But they took my leg off in a hurry. They didn't fool around. Did your unit take mortar fire before then? I mean, not that day because you said it was quiet, but uh, you know, how much how much action you know, had, had, your, had your unit seen in those in those days before. Lauren Colson was a buddy I trained with at Camp Ann, Texas. He got wounded three different times, not serious enough. They put him right back in combat. And he said, where I got hit, he said, we didn't get that territory back till February the 12th. In other words, a little over two months. And they got it back. But he was in, he got treated three times, he told me. And that's what, we didn't talk about much, really. I lost a lot of boys. So you had, you had lost some people in your unit before. Yeah. You, you, you were hit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 379, Company Patton's Army, 3rd Army. How you? What what was daily life like? You know, on that, on those front lines. I mean, what do you what do you do in that uh, time when you're like, when you're not taking fire and that sort of thing? We just kept moving all the time. Just kept moving. You know, there wasn't too much going on. And I suppose the Germans were trying to keep out of our sight or watch this go by or didn't attempt. And once in a while, we'd get a prisoner, and we. Our sergeant would take it back somewhere and probably got five or six of those on the second trip. But we never got run over by nobody again when we was heading for Germany and over toward the Saar River. So were you taking, what, sniper fire, you think? or We didn't take anything. Mm -hmm. Wasn't nothing. <laughs> you can't believe it, can you? Until that one day. Yeah. Well, we got sniper fire with the first trip I was out when we lost some officers and stuff. But the second trip, we took a different route. Do you, how, do you remember how far from the front line you were on that first trip? Front line? Well, the, where, how, how close to the, 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 the farthest that the Allies had gotten, you know? Oh, probably two, three hundred yards. So you were right there. Um, do you remember, you, you say you, that your, your group had taken some prisoners at that point. Yeah. They just, one at a time, would all come in. Not a bunch. One at a time, walk in. It kind of scared you when you see them walk by. How they get treated? I have no idea. <laughs> you just let them pass, huh? <laughs> no idea. Um, what was the 
do you remember? I mean, I don't hardly say there's spare time or anything that you had when you're when when you're you know moving in that direction, but uh, we just kept moving. No, it, what, now one now on the la that last trip out, I was telling you about where we never run into anything, and when I finally got hit, mm -hmm. there's Russian soldiers in barricades. Uh, just a fence around them. One of them was eating flour, it looked like, and the other was a barricade. And it wasn't very big. And they was eating meat. I think it was horse meat. But they were just locked in there and the Germans were gone. And these are Russians, they want to fight. And there wasn't nobody else around there but them. I don't know how that happened. How'd they get there? That's, that's, that's almost the wrong front. <laughs> it was on the front. The Russian prisoners, the Germans. Oh, the Germans had taken the Russian prisoners. Yes. Oh, okay. So, so we knew they were close, but no, didn't know where they were at. Mm -hmm. So that, that's about it on that. So did you free those prisoners or bring them behind your lines or what? Uh... No, we didn't do nothing. That, they just reported back what they found, and somebody else come and get them. Mm -hmm. They probably come in trucks to get them, because we never run into no opposition that going that way. What was the What was the food like when you? The food I had. I don't want to even talk about it. K rations for one seven day stretch, and then last seven day stretch, K rations. Period. What's in a K ration for those of us oh, who have God. never had the pleasure of having a K ration before? Oh, there's all kinds of dried type food, like you buy at a store, you know. The dried food that'll keep for several days is in bags, all kinds of stuff in it. Not that good, huh? <laughs> well, it's better than nothing. Were you able to keep up? With events going on elsewhere, what? Uh, how did you, how did your unit learn what was going on elsewhere? Did you even know? Didn't know nothing. Nothing. Quiet. No radios. No stars and stripes. Nothing like that. No nothing. Not where we were at. I think we were spearheading where the bulge is what it amounts to. You mentioned that the, the, you're, you're, you, you were injured not too long before what we consider the Battle of the Bulge began. Yeah. You knew nothing about it at that point. No. Nope. So you brought back, you come to England, and, and then what was, what was life like once, uh, you, know, once, you, once you, you, you crossed back on that Liberty ship? Well, the Liberty ship that took us down to the equator when they got us down there, went across the I just told you before, that was 12 days coming home. And they got down to South Carolina and they put us in C-47s and flew us up to Chicago in the C-47s right around Battle Creek, Michigan. So I stayed in Battle Creek, Michigan for a long time. I was there quite a while, probably six months. And once in a while I'd get me another guy get on the train, go to Chicago, and then I'd come to Hudson, and then go back after I'd been there about three, four months. And they treated us real good up there. As a VA hospital? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Battle Creek, Michigan. Boy, the guy stole the blankets out of that from the government. You never believe what you were seeing. They throw them out the window. They finally got that stopped, though. Good to win, good looking blankets. You, you're talking about, you know, you mentioned some of you were in your, was in your unit, and you didn't talk much about what happened. How people, like when you're, when you're in the hospital or anything like that, did you share, swap stories about? Not Your too, ex experiences not, and all not that? Not too much. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys in that hospital in Battle Creek. 
was in bad shape. A lot of them, one of them lost both hands with a hand grenade. A lot of them had lost both their legs. And a lot of them was just plain paralyzed. We was in a room of probably about 30 of them. And they were probably the worst wounded ones. So people didn't talk about? About too much. Mm -hmm. When I got up to walk the first time on my artificial leg, I thought, oh my God. I got up, I couldn't hardly stand up. I was dizzy and everything else. And that would have been the first time you stood upright, I guess. Yeah. Right? So it was life like adjusting to that. Yeah. And on top of that, I got home and I worked for the township for a year helping guys get GI loans and stuff. And then a job for the Department of Revenue opened up and I took it. And my artificial leg put me in Heinz Hospital three times. I had one that was made out of solid wood. And then I had one that was made out of plastic I could adjust myself. That's the one I had to wear most of the time. And those got to be a pain in the neck. And after they put me in the hospital three times in Chicago, I went and talked to a lawyer about it. I said, you know, Illinois made me wear my leg. Or I couldn't work. And I said, I can't do that anymore. So I threw the leg away, laid it in the alley, two of them, laid them side by side, took some leather goods off of them I might need. And then my neighbor, Margaret Rovoice, sat there and watched the city walk around them things for a half hour before they had nerve enough to pick them up and throw them in the garbage. I didn't have no use for them. But eventually you... Did, did you wind up getting a leg that you could? I never got a leg. From then on, I wore crutches. I've been on crutches ever since 1950. Mm -hmm. I used to wear out a pair of crutches like I got out in the truck every six months, and the ones I got out there now, I've had about three years. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you think back to when you were a foreman and you decided, <laughs> I'm going to go in the Army, yeah, I mean, you compared it to once you left and what you've gone through. Yeah, you still made. You think you made the right decision? Hmm? You think you made the right decision, or what do you think about? I never even thought about it. Uh -huh. Never even discussed it. You know, mm -hmm. but the VA has been real good to me, and I get real good service from them. And since I fell here a while back and hurt my tailbone, why now they uh, nurse come and see me every two weeks, so, and then check our stuff out, check my pills. <laughs> That's a but, joke. <laughs> but but I mean yeah, you've you've been very familiar with the VA for years and years. Ever since 82. I didn't go to the VA until 82 hmm. when I retired from the insurance business. I went down there and he checked me all out. One day, walking across the street, my wife was doing taxes and I was doing insurance and I raised my, I fell in the middle of the street and banged this arm. So I went down there to the VA and it's got, for my first checkup, it's the 82. I told that doctor, and I said, you know, this arm here, that's all higher I can get it. How'd you hurt? And I said, well, it fell on the ice. And he sent me up x-ray, come back. He said, sign this form. <laughs> this is, what is this, a death warrant? I said, no. He uh, gave me a shot, 
in the shoulder and he come back in the, and he says, you sit in that wheelchair and stay there for one hour and don't you move. So I did that. He come back and he says, raise your arm. Went all the way up. I got one to the latter part in 98 or something. Still in good shape. Two shots. Do you do you regret having gone in the army at all? Well, I don't necessarily regret anything. I, I made my own choice. You know, I never. You know, I had a few cousins who was in the service and got killed over, and traveled around quite a bit. As far as you're concerned, mm -hmm. I, I I can't do what I'd like to do or what I could do because I would wound up being a farmer. Um, how, did, have you talked about your experiences with family? Did it take a while to to to, to no, did, did people ask? I mean, how how did well, how did the whole story sharing? I haven't. Been I didn't tell them too much about it. Mm -hmm. Nothing. One of my grandson asked me a bunch of questions here a while back when he was going to school. Uh, Lee Cox, and I didn't tell him too much. How come? Well, never. Most of the guys don't discuss it. It's done. It's over. Forget it. <laughs> but you decided to <laughs> sit in front of a TV camera for, for, for it to do this. This is the first time for this kind of ordeal for me. It's the first time I've ever done something like this. But uh, you feel it's important that, that people people know, I guess, huh? Well, I suppose it will answer a lot of questions because I was supposed to have had an accident in a Jeep and all that kind of stuff, which is false. You know, might clear up some of it. Anything else to add? Anything I forgot to ask? Any other stories that come from there that you... You mean related? That, I'm, that, I, that I skipped over? <laughs> uh, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's interesting. I've never been in a situation like this. So I've tried to be as liberal as I could be without being off base. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're yes. We're thank done. you for your time. Terrific. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. Particularly this camera crew. <laughs> I forgot he told me where he come from. <laughs>